I'm going to invite you to go ahead and have a seat and uh, grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Romans chapter 2. Uh, Romans chapter 2 is going to be our text today. If uh, you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles around you in the seats and turn to page 1117 and you will find the second chapter of Romans. If uh, uh, you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, it's family weekend. I think you probably figured that out by now because the kids are in here with you. Uh, hopefully you picked up some uh, cookies or donuts or treats on the way in. And uh, kids, hopefully you're going to have a good time in here. We're going to play a game in just a minute. But before we do, let me introduce uh, Julie Moronis, our, our co-teacher today with me. Julie is the administrator principal of Calvary Christian Academy. She's been a part of Calvary Christian Academy for 16 of our 17 years as a school. She, uh, it's family weekend. I thought I'd bring in a kid expert, you know, help me out. And uh, <laughs> she was a teacher at CCA for 12 years, including teaching uh, my daughters. And she uh, has been the administrator for four years. And over that time, the school has doubled in size. But a lot of people may not even know that we have a school. So tell us a, a little bit about uh, Calvary Christian Academy, please. Well, Calvary Christian Academy is a blessed place. Um, right now, we have about 250 kids. Enrolled for next year, I think we're right at 300. So we're growing, and it's an exciting thing to see. Um, our teachers are accredited. All of our, our teachers from kindergarten through eighth grade have degrees in education and also have their certifications. And so if you're interested in our school, please come see me. Yeah. Hey, uh, we're, okay, we're going to play a game. And this is like the easiest game you've ever played. So everybody's got to play, all right? It's, got, it's called the sit-down game. And I know you guys are saying like, hey, we're all sitting down, so this is really easy. Now, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to have you stand up. And then what I'm going to do is, is Julie and I are going to mention things. And uh, if that applies to you, then you sit down and you're out. Okay, in other words, you lose. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's okay. Everybody's going to lose at some point. Uh, we've, had, we've had winners, but uh, anyway. So you guys got it? Really simple game, so stand up. And if we say something that applies to you, then you just sit down. And uh, boys and girls, you're going to learn some things about your moms and dads or grandparents that are with you yes. when, we, when we do this. So pay attention to when they sit down. Uh, okay, the, the theme of the game is this. It's names that you have been called. Names that you have been called by someone. These are not nice names. These are not names of praise. These are mean names. So... Uh, and by the way, these are names that, that Julie and I, uh, one of us or both of us have been called at some point in Everyone. our lives. So Everyone. I'm going to start off with something, you know, really personal uh, towards me. I got called Gap Tooth, Buck Tooth. Uh, if you've been made fun of by your teeth, you've been called Vampire because you've got fangs or, mm -hmm. or something like that, then have a seat. Okay. okay. Some of you went down. Of Sorry about that. I feel your pain. All right. Um, if you have ever been called a goody two shoes, you need to sit down. <laughs> That's right. That's okay. Me. Gotcha. All right. If you have been made fun of for being a sissy, a pansy, a wimp, or a tomboy, have a seat. A tomboy. Yeah. Have a seat. I didn't say you like the names or whatever, so. That's right. Okay. If you have been accused of being stuck up or conceited. Or if you've been called down. a princess in a or not <laughs> kind way. Princess in an unkind way. <laughs> All Thank right. you. All right. I, like I, this next one hits close to home for me because I can call it a lot. If you've been called a nerd or a dork or a geek, have a seat. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, we had a few on that one. Let's see. Next one, short or tall. If you're either too tall or too You've been called a short. midget or a giant, <laughs> lanky. Uh, you know, can't reach things from where you are, then that kind of stuff you, uh, no. All right. If you've been called fat or skinny, have a seat. Yeah. <laughs> hey, true story. One. My brother growing up called me Bay Window Belly. I didn't even know what that meant, except I knew he was making fun of me for being fat. And now Bay he just calls window. me fat, dumb, and happy. So. Oh, no. Okay. This one's hard, but if you've ever been called ugly... Or, which one of my brothers did, he said, does your face hurt? Because it's hurting me. <laughs> so if anybody's ever made a comment like that, have a seat. All right, here's my favorite quartet. If you've ever been called stupid, moron, idiot, or dummy, have a seat. Ooh, we lost a few. 
<laughs> we have a couple more. Okay, if you have been called mean or rude. Or cranky. Cranky. <laughs> or cranky, have a seat. Okay, we're down to just a few. Okay, so how about weirdo, freak, or strange? No. Oh, he's out. <laughs> Hey, look at this. We've got like three people still standing. Congratulations, four people. Congratulations, you guys are the winners. I don't have anything for you. I didn't think anybody would actually survive all those names. Uh, so uh, I just want to know what bubble you guys grew up in. Because yeah. um, my world was a lot meaner than that. Apparently. See, the, the reality is people are mean. And, and the question is why? Why are we so mean to each other? Uh, and our text today gives us an idea about meanness, where it comes from. Uh, now, your Bible's in the seats. If you grab one of those, that's an English Standard Version. I'm not going to read out of that. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation because uh, it's a little more kid-friendly. You can read it and see the differences if you want to out of the ESV, or you can follow along on the screen with the New Living Translation. The Apostle Paul says, You may think that you can condemn such people, evil people is what he's saying, but you are just as bad as you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Uh, so why are we mean? We're mean because we judge others. We, we determine that we're good and they're bad. We're righteous and they're wicked. And so we treat them as if they were less important to God than we are. And so we become mean. And, and uh, you know, that happens at, from the youngest to the oldest. Uh, Julie, you work with sweet, innocent children. Yes. Uh, are they ever mean? Um, as a matter of fact, they are. Um, we have kiddos from the little, little guys that are three years old all the way through eighth grade. And unfortunately, we do see them be mean sometimes. They name call and the things that you would expect. Um, I don't see a lot of physical, you know, aggression, but I do see that, the unkind words. And even last week, I was in a preschool class with four-year-olds, and I popped in so that I could cover a class for, for the teacher who needed to get some lunch. And they were so cute. They were seated there having their lunch, and one of the little guys, little cherub face, asked me to open his snack for him, which I did. And then the next one asked, and the next one. And then the teacher came back in, and all of the kiddos turned and looked at that first sweet little boy and said, he did it. I had opened up all the treats and snacks they were not supposed to have yet. They played me like a fiddle. They did, and they, then they blamed him. He was so sneaky. Uh, so we're not surprised that, that kids are mean, but you know, adults can be mean too. And, mm -hmm. and we know this because we drive, right? You ever been in traffic? People get really mean in traffic. There's all kinds of one-fingered salutes. Uh, there's the glare. You know, road rage is a real thing. <laughs> if you're going to do that, take your Calvary sticker off your car, please. Uh, no, I mean, people are mean. They're mean. You know what's funny? People are mean in amusement parks. I mean, we go to amusement parks to play. And, and what's the sign at Disneyland? The happiest place on yeah. earth. Then why are people so angry at Disneyland? Right? You see, you see parents yelling at their kids, see them yelling at each other. You see them being mean and pushing people out of the way and running them over with a stroller or whatever. People are not happy there. They're mean. Or, or 
and this one confuses me too. What about restaurants? Why in the world would anyone ever be mean in a restaurant? People are bringing you food and drinks. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a good thing, don't you think? They just magically appear on your table. This is wonderful. But I've watched people be, you know, mean to the waiter or waitress and mean about stuff and mean to each other. And, and, and people are mean. It's because we judge each other. And when we judge, we start treating people that way. So today, we just want to talk about four truths from this passage that apply to all of us, from the youngest to the oldest, four things that we need to hear that the Apostle Paul is telling us from this. So the first one is this. God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't play favorites. He actually says that right out loud, for God shows no partiality. He, he's not favoring one. And this is kind of different because in the Old Testament, it kind of looks like God plays favorites because he had a chosen people. The, the Jewish people were God's chosen people because he had to explain who he was to somebody so that we could worship him. And so he revealed himself to the Jewish people and he brought Messiah through the Jewish people to them. So Jesus came into the world to save all of us and, and he came through the Jewish people. But when Jesus showed up, things changed. Now God has always loved everyone, but now we know that. You and I know that. That, that means that God loves all, so he loves you. Some of you need to understand that God loves you. But he also loves that person sitting next to you. Surprise. Yeah, some of you are. It's like, really? Yeah, he loves them. And guess what? He loves your neighbors, and he loves the people who work with you, and he loves the people that, uh, you know, the strangers out there. He even loves your enemies. Because God doesn't play favorites. Now, how many of you, uh, growing up, you were the favorite child in your family? Oh, Ooh. there's actually some hands going up. Yeah. Some of the kids are raising their hands right now. Yeah. How many of you weren't the favorite children in your family? Oh, ouch. Yeah. That's kind of painful. Uh, Julie, you've got three older siblings. Yes. And I always just assume that the baby is always the favorite. Um, were, you the, were you the favorite in your family? No, I wasn't. <laughs> hey, I got a heckler back there. No, um, I was not the favorite. My parents were really good about making sure that we all felt loved and affirmed. Um, but... I can't say that there wasn't a difference between the boys and the girls. And so um, that was hard sometimes. I, I definitely have a story. My brother, my oldest brother, who is about eight years older than me, he, when he was 16, did not have to go on a family vacation that the others, uh, we were going on. We were headed out camping and we were gonna be gone a month and he got to stay behind because he had a part-time job. And on top of that, he was told, because he was so mature at 16, that he could have a party at the house. Now, whether that was a month-long party, I don't know, but when we came back, that party was going on, and it was exciting when we arrived home. Typical teenage party with I would some say illegal substances for that age group? Quite possibly, uh -huh. yes. And, um, but he was not in trouble because he had been told that he could do that. And I wouldn't have lived through that. No, but my, my parents even talked to neighbors and said, no, he had permission. Now, fast forward, when I am 16, maybe 17, and I've asked to attend a party, a beach party, and my parents say yes, but I have a curfew that I have to be home for, I go to this party, I come back alone because the friend who rode with me was allowed to stay later than I was, and I got lost on the freeway. So I'm driving and I'm somewhere in LA because we live in Southern California and nothing looks familiar. And I see a light off the side of the freeway and it is some kind of, I don't know, mini mart or something, but there's a phone booth. Wait, for those of you who are too young to know what phone booths are, right? go home and Google it. These ancient things that actually had a telephone because this is pre-cell phone, pre-Google, no pre-GPS. No GPS. So I take a coin, children, and I put it inside this machine and I pick up the phone and I call and I call my mom and dad and say, hey, I am lost. What I left out just now is that I also locked my keys in my car when I did this. Yeah. So I call my mom and dad. They instantly come down and get me but they're furious. I was irresponsible and I didn't take care of myself properly and I got grounded for two weeks. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> so God doesn't play favorites. No. Can't say the same for you know, all of us, but yeah. God does not play favorites. He loves all of us completely, mm -hmm. even when we look around and think that other people have better blessings than us. God yeah. still loves us completely. He doesn't play favorites. So that's number one. Number two, all of us are guilty. Yes. All of us 
are guilty. Um, the reason that we shouldn't judge others is because we're guilty. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We're, we're all guilty. Uh, you see, God doesn't see us as good people and bad people. Sometimes we do. We kind of think we're good people and other people are bad people. God doesn't see us that way. God just sees us all as guilty as people who deserve or who need his grace because we all deserve hell, but God wants us to have heaven. So we all need the grace of God. So judging others, kids, I shared this with your parents last week, but I want you to hear this too because uh, I think this, this will stick. When you judge others, when you call other people names, when you accuse them of things, what you're doing is you are like one pig calling another pig dirty. Okay? Now, if one pig calls another pig dirty, it's true, but it applies to that pig too. So uh, when you tell someone else they're guilty, guess what? You're guilty as well. Uh, see, we love to proclaim other people's guilty. We love to point out their flaws and their faults and, and the things they're doing wrong, but we like to excuse ourselves. We want to think that we're innocent and we didn't do it. Uh, and uh, Julie, you're a principal of a school, so I know kids <laughs> love going to the principal's office. Any kids here like going to the principal's office? There's some hands that go up. Okay. They must be there to get an award, yeah. those two. But most kids don't like going to your office. Um, <laughs> no. How are they with, uh, with the whole honesty thing uh, about guilt? Not great. Most of the kiddos I see when they're in trouble, um, they want to blame other, other kids. They want to say that it, somebody else did it. It wasn't their fault. Sometimes it's the teacher's fault. <laughs> Sometimes they'll even throw their parents under the bus and say, oh, my, my mom told me I could. Um, very rarely do they ever um, tell what they've done. I think I've only had one student in four years that has said, it was my fault, I was mad, I did it, I shouldn't have. And confession is always yeah. better than getting caught. I learned this as a teenager because, uh, you know, when I did something wrong, I just learned that if I went ahead and confessed it to my parents, yeah. I was still going to get grounded. <laughs> I was still going to get the consequences. Uh, there was just a lot less anger involved. And, and so uh, we're all guilty. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is God offers forgiveness to all of us. God wants to forgive all of us. Verse 4 in this text actually says that. Or do you presume on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance? God wants to forgive us. Uh, that's why he sent Jesus into this world, to suffer and die for our sins, for your sins and mine, to pay for our rebellion so that he could rescue us from hell and take us to heaven to be with him, to be his sons and daughters. And everyone, every single person, no matter what you've done or where you've been or how you've failed, can be forgiven by God if we simply call upon the name of the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul actually wrote in Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and so we want you to know the mercy of God. We want you to know the forgiveness of God. God wants you to know his mercy and his forgiveness. And, and so if you haven't done that, we, we really want to encourage you to embrace the mercy of God. Just simply admit that you've sinned and ask him to forgive you because he will do that. He wants to do that. Now, once you're forgiven and you know you're a child of God and you know that, that that mercy is real in your life, then God wants us to forgive others. He wants that that grace to flow from us to other people. Uh, and Julie, uh, you got a great example in your life about why. Yeah. When I was young, I was married. I got married young and I married a cheater, but I didn't know it. And when I had been married five years and I had a year old baby girl, um, my husband left me for someone else. And it broke my heart. I was devastated. But I loved Jesus and um, I knew that forgiveness was important. And I chose to forgive him. And it was a journey, absolutely. But I believe that because I made that choice, God was able to bless me. Later, I, I met another wonderful man. We've been married over 25 years. We had another daughter, and my life has been blessed. But I believe it was because I did what I was asked to do, yeah. and God was able to bless me because of it. See, God wants us to be forgiven. He, he wants us to know that we're loved and that all of our sins are atoned for. But then when we receive that gift, he wants us to pass that on to others. 
He wants, to sh- uh, wants us to share that grace and that mercy. And, and, it, and, it, and get this, whatever God has forgiven you, you don't deserve that forgiveness. It's a gift. It's grace. And the people that have wronged you, they don't deserve your forgiveness. But God wants you to forgive them for you. Because if you don't forgive, you build up that bitterness, that anger in your heart, and it takes root, and you miss out on the blessings that God has for us. We miss out on them. It hurts us. But when we forgive, when we, we truly take the grace that we've received and we extend it to other people who don't deserve it, then God frees us from that anger and that bitterness, and we're able to experience His best and His blessings in our life. But that only happens when we receive the mercy and we extend the mercy to others. So I have to ask this question. First of all, have you been forgiven? Have you embraced the mercy that God has offered to you? Because it's a gift, but you have to receive that gift. And if you have, if you know that you're a child of God, have you forgiven the people that have hurt you? Are you trying to? Because that's honoring to God if you're committed to doing that. So we're all guilty and God offers forgiveness to all of us. The last thing we want you to know is that God wants us to choose to love, not judge others. God wants us to choose to love, not judge others. In in verses 6 through 8, I'm not going to read them again. uh, Paul makes it really clear that we're going to receive the consequences for our actions. And so he's calling us as sons and daughters of God to love one another and not judge each other. Because you can't really do both at the same time. Think about it. When you judge other people, uh, first of all, it makes you proud. Because you're acting like you're above them, like you're better than them. Well, I know better. Yeah, I do better than this. You know, I can't believe it. So when you judge people, you're, you're being proud. Scripture says over and over and over again that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. How many of you would willingly put yourself in a position where you know that God is in opposition to you? Anybody? Yeah, see, nobody wants to be in that position. How many of you would like to be in a position where God is for you? Oh, look at this. Everybody who's awake, raise their hand. So, so here's, the, here's the thing. We know this, so then why would we do this? Why would we step into that place of judging others so that God is aligned against us? Second reason that we should love instead of judge is because when we judge people, uh, it makes us mean. Because the moment we think we're better than them, then we treat them as if they're less significant, less important. And that's so we excuse ourselves for being mean, for calling them names, for treating them poorly. Uh, Jesus said, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 describes love this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Kind. So you can't be mean and loving at the same time. Uh, That's why we want to choose to love instead of judging. Because God has loved us and and he has the right to judge us. And he said, I'd rather love you than judge you. And, and, And so we want to make that same choice, which means that if we're going to do that, then we need to be kind. And we need to be kind in person. In other words, in reality. Because everywhere you go, you should be kind. It's not like selective, like I'll be kind at church and I'll be mean everywhere else. It's I should be, you should be kind everywhere you go. So let me just be real blunt. You should be kind in restaurants. I already mentioned that. I watch people be mean in restaurants. I go out to eat a lot. Uh, I like food. And uh, and you probably do too, but I I watch people and and we should be kind to the serving staff, the wait staff, the people who are taking care of us. Uh, Just for practical reasons, you should be kind to them because people can spit in your food. You think about this, why would you want to be a jerk when the people have that kind of power over you? And I, I know no one would ever do that, but then again, I worked in restaurants and I knew some of those people, so um, I, I'm always going to be kind in a restaurant. But even beyond that, you represent Jesus. Why wouldn't you be kind to them? They're taking care of you. Now, there are people in restaurants who are jerks and who are cheap. Nobody wants to wait on them. And there are some people who are jerks and generous. They tip well. Eh. There are people who are kind but who are cheap. We want to be the people who are kind and tip well, okay? Just honestly saying this, how are we going to represent Jesus if we're kind and cheap? 
Or how are we going to represent Jesus if we're a jerk and we tip well? No, you, you be kind because we want to be loving towards people and tip well because you represent Jesus everywhere you go. So in other words, uh, love people and tip for Jesus, okay? And, and, and just think about that because they know where you're coming from. They know the Christians are coming in from church, and I want them to be excited about Calvary people coming to their restaurant, not going, oh, those are those cheap Baptists. We don't want them here. Uh, so be kind in restaurants. And students, children, be kind. Be kind to your classmates. Be kind to your teacher. Be kind to your parents, your siblings. It's a choice that you make, and you have good hearts. Be kind to younger students. Some of you can remember a time maybe when an older kid was mean to you. You need to be a champion for those younger kids. Be kind to them. Parents, be kind in the parking lot at drop-off and pick-up at school. And right? in the church parking lot when you're leaving. And that one, too. Please be kind to one another. In stressful situations, parents, be kind to teachers. They truly want the best for your children. They went to school and got an education in how the best practices are to teach them. They truly want to bless your kids. That is their heart's desire, so be kind. And when you hear those stories that come home, you know what, really, really think about that because we hear a lot of stories on our end too. <laughs> and we're giving you the benefit of the doubt. So be kind in school and be kind in sports. Kids, how many of you yes. like to play sports? Come on, see your hands. Lots of hands yeah. go up, okay. When you're playing yeah. sports, be kind to one another. Be kind to the, the other team. Look, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Mm -hmm. And you can't always win. So be kind to the other team. Be good sports. And be kind to your teammates. Some of them are better than others. Some of us try really hard, but we're not good, okay? That's kind of I was, so everybody can't be the best. Everybody can't be as talented as you. So be kind to one another. And parents... I love the fact that you go and support your kids and cheer them on enthusiastically. When you're cheering your kids on, can you be kind? Don't be those parents. Because you know who we're talking about. The ones that are yelling at their kid and blasting them because they made a mistake in the field. You know, be kind to the you know, coach because they didn't put your kid in because your kid's better than all the other kids combined. Be kind, please, to the referees. Come on, for goodness sake, they are not trained professionals or else they would be on TV on Sundays, okay? <laughs> These are people who, who are just wanting to help kids play a game. Be kind to them. They're not going to ruin your kid's athletic career because they blew a call. Remember, represent Jesus in the stands. That's one of those places you have a, a tremendous influence to show people what Christ is really like. Support your kids and be kind. Families, sometimes... Because we know each other well, you think you might know the motivation of a, a parent or a brother or sister. You think you know what they're thinking. We need to be kind to our families, to those that are closest to us. God is the one who knows our heart, and we are judging them when we think we know their motivation. We don't. You should be kindest to your family members, at least as kind to them as you would show courtesy to others. Please be kind. So on behalf of uh, all men here, can I just say, uh, ladies, no, we don't do that to irritate you, okay? Uh, and because uh, sometimes, you know, I get asked the question, are you just trying to irritate me? What were, or, or, the answer is to the question, what were you thinking when you did that? Um, we weren't. Okay, we really weren't thinking at all, and, and, and I'm just saying this because uh, Julie said, be kind to your families, and what we do is we judge each other's motives when we don't know the motives. Sometimes we're just clueless, and so on behalf of men everywhere, um, yes, we are that clueless, and we weren't thinking, and we're sorry, okay? So uh, be kind in, <laughs> all right, the guys are clapping. Yeah. <laughs> the, See, I actually let it slip and just called us all morons last service, and then I had to realize, oh, wait, we just did the name thing. We're not playing a game now, so I'm a moron. I know that. So we got to be kind in person, wherever we take our bodies, but nowadays with, uh, uh, you know, the, the online stuff, by the way, how many of you have computers or a smartphone or something like that? Yeah, almost every hand goes up. There's this wonderful world called social media that we're a part of, and we need to be kind on social media. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this, this specifically. Can we be kind when it comes to politics? Um, the, uh, wow, I, I like you guys. Here, here's the thing. 
All of us have political opinions. I respect your opinions. Uh, I've got strong political opinions too. All right, uh, that is great. That is awesome. We all need to have our opinions. But when we're communicating about those, do we really benefit at all by calling people names? Do we really advance our, you know, ideology or our convictions by, you know, at attacking somebody else's intelligence? It really doesn't pan out. And by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you represent Jesus everywhere you go, including online. So before you respond in a derogatory way, before you forward something that's, that really is angry, how about you actually think, um, is this something Jesus approves of? I mean, because there's some, you know, viewpoints that may coincide with, with biblical convictions that are communicated in a way that is ungodly. And the ends don't justify the means. We represent Jesus. And if we're going to represent him to this culture, then we need to be kind online. And that doesn't just mean politics. It also means... Social media and bullying. Your kids are exposed to so much. Young people in here, you have access to the internet, and there's so much happening there. And they're not emotionally, physically, chemically ready to put those boundaries in place for themselves or to deal with that. It used to be that kids went to school, came home, did whatever they were going to do at home, but it was a non-social environment. They didn't have to worry about the social things that were going on, but they're no longer protected at home if they're constantly engaged online. Those boundaries need to be in place for their protection. The, uh, I read an article this week that said 25% of seven-year-olds have smartphones. Yeah. Uh, Julie shared an article uh, with, uh, with me that, that said that uh, a, a high school class, a class of ninth graders, uh, a teacher polled them all and 82% had social media accounts that their parents didn't know about. Yes. And, and, and what we want to say as parents always is, not my kid. Not my kid. Uh, you know, my, I know everything about my kid. Let me just ask parents, adults in here, how many of you did stuff in, you know, when you were kids that your parents didn't actually know about? Yeah. Uh, some of you are going to have real interesting conversations over lunch now. Uh, <laughs> So here's the thing, if we did that, uh, why are we thinking that our kids aren't? And, and here's, the, here's the scary thing. Parents, it's our job to teach our kids, to love our kids, to nurture our kids, and to protect our kids. And, and as children, they are not uh, aware of appropriate boundaries and safeties to, to take. And, and so we need to help them uh, be able to do that. And parents, we want you to have that conversation, first of all, with each other, and then with your kids. And let them know what your convictions are. And if your convictions don't match the world at large, that's perfectly fine. This is your choice as a family, and it's your responsibility as moms and dads to protect your children the way that you see fit and to do it best. And I know some of these kids right now are not liking us for sharing this because they want access to their, their computers. But look, I was, you know, I was bullied. I was a new kid a lot uh, in schools. I got bullied at school, but I could go home and I wasn't bullied there. I was safe. But kids today are exposed 24-7. That's why there's yeah. an epidemic of suicide. That's why, yes. uh, because, and let's just be honest, some of our kids are getting bullied and we don't know it. And some of our kids are bullies and we don't know it. Yep. And, and parents, it's our responsibility to be involved. Grandparents, the, the grandkids come over, they, they want your devices right away. They want access to that stuff. We need to be informed too. It's the reality of the world. And if we're going to love and not judge, then we have to be aware of what's going on, including protecting our kids from the damage that is out there. So God doesn't play favorites, even though sometimes we do. And all of us are guilty. We can't escape that reality. God offers forgiveness to all of us and wants us to forgive. And he's calling us to love people, not judge people. That's about as plain as we can get. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Because God is calling us to make a choice. And he wants us to represent Jesus. Let's pray.